Hello and welcome back to the Cybersock podcast with me, Adam. And me, Ryan. Today we've got a special guest, uh, Dr. Catherine Jones of uh, Cardiff University, a senior lecturer in the School of Computer Science. Hello, how are you doing? Hi guys, and thanks for inviting me. Very excited to have you here. Hello, it's very nice to see you. <laughs> <laughs> Mentioned subtly in a few of the past podcasts. <laughs> As, As the, the lecturer. lecturer. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. We can reveal that to the audience now. <laughs> <laughs> How are you today? So I'm, I'm good today. Um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting day in the UK, I think, for various reasons. But yeah, I'm just cracking on with some work. We've got a sunny sky in Cardiff and it's only March. It's not March, is it? What, what month is it? February. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> can you delete that bit? <laughs> I think that was fun. <laughs> Believe that, eh? <laughs> oh, I don't know where I am. Yeah, I, okay. I don't know where I am ever. I think it's harder to keep track of days, weeks and months when you just work in your spare bedroom for most of the time or you study, you know? Mm. My sleep schedule is awful. It Was yes. that ruined by the lecturer giving you uh, <laughs> <laughs> an assessment to do in the autumn? I just like sleep when I want to, which is kind of fun and kind of just... <laughs> I'm just awake at random times and I go to sleep for a few hours at a time. It's probably not good for my health. But. I do remember reading something and they were arguing that the human body does best with going to bed early-ish or about 10. And then they were suggesting waking at something like 2am and then being awake in this kind of state of semi-sleep for two hours before going back to sleep again. I think I saw something online about you, you can like really maximise your sleep patterns by sleeping for half an hour every two hours or something or it was something like that you just like sleep if you sleep a little bit every time you get enough sleep but get more hours in the day or something i wouldn't be alive <laughs> no <laughs> i can't just sleep for half an hour every two hours i i need a full 11 hours every <laughs> night <laughs> wow 11 hours wow well that's what's been happening recently i'm i'm seeing as adam sleeping pattern is just completely been wrecked <laughs> yeah I, I sleep quite late I'm definitely a night person but how, then I how find late is late for you though between 12 and 1 probably mm. that I would be an really... early night for me <laughs> would it <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> all right okay I, li I like a lion if that's possible but I have a theory I, I really met a software engineer or computer scientist really that is a morning person mm. software engineers tend to always be nighttime people I'm sure I read something once that people who are awake more at night are usually more creative. I'm not going to fact check that. I'm just sure I've read that somewhere before. <laughs> mm. I think especially when you're working late at night like that, what I find works best for me is when I become almost obsessed with a project where I'm doing it at night because I'm kind of obsessed with it and I want to mm. do it. That's how I end up working at night. That ob ob obsessive nature that I have in myself. <laughs> Although I remember you working on a project with me last summer and I remember you saying that you were dreaming of it. Yeah, <laughs> I, I was dreaming about it <laughs> because I think... when I was going to sleep, I was taking that 15 minutes before I went to sleep to think about the project, think about like all these different things. And then I would sleep and I would dream about it. <laughs> <laughs> So it was with so, you. Yeah. You were you were putting it back into your mind. It was with me all the time. Yeah, and that's the thing with software, isn't it? Because the way we're connected now, and the working from home, I think it's become harder to try and draw these boundaries where we might have time for us that's away from our work. Mm -hmm. It's it, that's much more difficult, I think, because we're always able to connect. You know, within a few minutes, we can walk into the room, and the next thing we can be working on that project again. Yeah. I, I wonder if it's something as well to do with, like, when you're working on your own compared to working with others. So, like, for example, in that research project, although I was, you know, I had you there and I, I knew that you would, you know, be able to help with or talk through anything I wanted, but I was still working on it individually. So I guess that's more of a reason why I would think about it so much on my own, because I didn't have anyone really to work on it with in that respect. Do you know what I mean? Yes, you weren't waiting on anybody to anybody to also do thinking on it yes yeah, so mm. i would just and think in my own brain late at night <laughs> instead that's interesting isn't it because i think often we think with projects if you work in, on it yourself you're in control of all the aspects of it it's yours to think about but actually is it because you it's more easy to obsess because it all belongs to you yeah i worry that 
if I work by myself, I will just go down the rabbit hole and it will be a while until I look back and go, well, actually, that decision way ages ago is, is not, not a good decision. If someone could have told me that at the time, it would have been much better. There's but no I would have been to... irritated. There was no, there's nobody that can call you on any of your ideas sort of mm. thing. It's just always yeah. a problem with software. You're always going to regret certain choices you made along the way. Whatever try, happens. Trying to, trying to like put barriers to, to stop that is, is, you know, sensible, helpful. Yes, but how realistic. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ryan, with you on my team, as I'm finding in this project, very, very reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'd, li I'd like to clarify that we're having fun. It's nice to see you working on a project together. And what I liked about one of your last podcasts is where you reflected back on the project you did for me a few summers ago. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. If we learned a lot since then. Yes, we have. And if there's anything me and Adam enjoy, it's a reflection, a retrospective. Yes. <laughs> so, Catherine, what, was the, what would you say the spark that got you initially interested in the software engineering world? But that's kind of an interesting one. I'm doing a podcast in a few weeks' time for, for Tramshed. And a couple of questions I might have, might get thrown around for that is, you know, who, who were your role models and why did you get into tech? And my role models were Princess Leia and She-Ra. <laughs> they, mm -hmm. they were the sort of role models I had, cartoons basically, not really people in tech at all. And it was only later then did I sort of see and, and and read about people like Bill Gates, which sort of started it sort of increasing my interest in tech. But really when I was in school, so I didn't have a computer at home. My dad was a head teacher and he would bring the school's BBC master home for me to play around with in holidays. <laughs> <laughs> so, <Love it. laughs> so that's that's what how I got into computers, I suppose, was he'd bring that home and I'd play Chucky Egg and Repton and, and really sort of enjoyed games from that point of view. And then when it came to, I was working in class because we used to have labs that we would sit to in partners and we would share a, a, P, a PC. And at the time they were they were BBCs and then they got upgraded. And I, I can't remember what they got upgraded to. I want to say Acons, but I, but I can't quite remember. So anyway, we'd work in pairs and my friend would always sort of take the lead on being the person who drives. I guess it's an early form of pair programming, really, but we weren't programming. We were using applications. It was more like IT, really. Mm -hmm. And I sort of realised as we were working there that if I let her always be the person who was who was driving or always be the person who was working on the apps that I wasn't really challenging myself and I remember distinctly thinking next time I need to pick somebody to work with that's different to my friend because she was very capable I need to push myself to to be that that person who can sit there and do that and I did and then from that point on I really started getting into IT and, and computing but again were, none of that was software engineering none of that was programming and then my parents campaigned a bit with the school to try and get them to run an IT A-level. Now, at the time, there was, I think, a computer science A-level, but nobody in the school could. And, and so that wasn't an option. I think I could have gone to one of the other comprehensive schools in the local area, like the boys' school, to do computer science. But anyway, they ran an IT A-level and I did that. And I really enjoyed that. There was like about eight of us in the class. And that kind of got me interested enough to think about applying to university then to do computer science. But it was a bit of a bit of a, I don't know, a bit crazy, really, to think about going to university to do a subject for which I did had no A-level experience. I couldn't code. I didn't have a computer and I'd never sent an email. <laughs> um. <laughs> it's interesting how much like the world has moved on since then, though, isn't it? Especially in the software world. It, it rapidly yeah. changed, I think, from the point I became an adult to the point where in my sort of my mid twenties went from nobody you really knew having a mobile phone to everybody having a smartphone, mm -hmm. and you know that was quite a big difference. If if someone's listening to this at university and they're thinking I'm going to leave uni, get to a job, what was that like? So I turned up at uni and I didn't have a computer to do a computer science degree and I'd never sent an email. So that was a bit interesting. And then I used to have to go across to the labs to do any sort of work that I needed to get done. And I did that for about two years and then I managed to build my own machine in my, fi in my final year. And that was great. And I'd been offered a job working for 
BT in Cardiff. It was a graduate placement. It was well paid at the time. To be honest, it was pretty well paid based on today's graduate wages. And it was in data warehousing. But it was about two or three weeks before I was due to start there and an opportunity came up to do a paid for PhD within the school. And the PhD was in telecoms, which sort of had some parity with the fact I was going to work for a telecoms company, but in a totally different area. So to do with like optimization of mobile networks. And I sort of sat there and thought, well, actually, I really enjoy being a student and doing a PhD that's funded seems like a really good idea. Because I sort of thought to myself that if I started earning money, I would probably, as in working in a company, I would probably not come back to do a PhD. Mm. And so it was worth a punt. So after my PhD, lots of my career has been reasonably opportunistic and Yeah, so I got a job working for a company, which was a London-based company with a branch in Cardiff that did exactly what my PhD was doing, which was cell planning and optimization of mobile networks. So the the chances of that were were reasonably, you know, it was an unusual type of company anyway. Uh, And so I went went to work for them. But the the kind of interesting thing was they took me on and they needed a C++ developer. But I was a Java developer and I didn't know any C++. So I I did find myself sitting there on the first day thinking, why am I here? I don't even know this language. So I literally sat there and had to learn from from day one. But yeah, I enjoyed it. It was a good good way in. What is your experience of learning new languages and new frameworks. How do you feel about that? Because I know there's a lot of people who feel afraid of learning new languages or just want to use the same kind of technologies, you know, all the time. Yeah, I mean, I think it is scary when you learn anything you don't know, isn't it? But as a software engineer, you're going to have to pick new things up all the time. I think that idea of in software engineering, the idea of being the person who now knows everything and never has to learn anything else just doesn't exist. Yeah. So I think I think it's an acceptance that we are lifelong learners and, and we'll always be learning something new. And if we're not and we haven't for a while, then something's probably gone wrong. I, I don't say it's a great idea, though, to take a developer role in a, in a language you know nothing at all of like I did. But, you know, <laughs> that wasn't the most sensible thing to do in some ways. But it's remarkable, I think, how much you can pick up in a number of weeks. You can go from literally not knowing something to knowing something quite well within a few weeks if you dedicate yourself to to learning it and you want it, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there's only certain things you really need to know when you're getting to grips with a new language. Particularly if there's already existing code bases and things, you, there's that jumping place to get off from. You're, you're looking at something and I want to do this. This is already here. Particularly nowadays, you can Google search a lot of it. Yeah, I mean there's no doubt that having access to like you say the the vast resources of the internet and I mean I learned from books really if I needed to pick up a new language and I bought the you know the latest book which may or may not have been the version I was running on my machine and now these days and you've got all the the plural sites and the LinkedIn learnings and etc and I think they can get you up the, the the sort of the hill of I don't know syntax of this language um now I can have a fast forward on that, perhaps. And that's where they are useful. But you don't really know it until you start to try and solve problems in that language, mm. I think is the thing. And so when I started in that company, they had a monolithic code base in mostly built in C++ and had very, very few tests and requirements weren't particularly documented. So when you went to it, you saw what they had, but you didn't really have much of an idea of what they intended it to be. And I think that's interesting. So there was no idea of what the intention had been and therefore was what they coded what they should have coded. But one good way in I found was I started working on their issues list. So in some ways I learned C++ through working through a bunch of issues they had with their code base and learning how to solve problems. Yeah, yeah. When I did work over the summer at this company I worked with, they were using PHP um, and Laravel and I've done absolutely no experience in it prior. But they kind of paired you up with one of the existing devs as kind of like a mentor. And I found, yeah, just getting stuck in and looking at the issues, looking at the code base, I could muddle my way through it. Yeah, and at the time, these senior devs, they just seem like gods, don't they? Because <laughs> you're working with them and they know, they not only know the tech up the inside out, they also know the code base. Yeah. And, you know, it can be really helpful. If you get into a place and there's some really good senior devs there who are willing to stop and help and spend that time. And I've always been lucky like that in my career. 
some some amazing people I've worked with, then it can be so helpful, I think, to junior developers or, or new developers as they come to the company. I know at some point you went off to work in a little startup. How did you find that? Was that what was that like comparatively? Yeah, so so it was exciting because the guys I used to work with in the company we were in, they decided to they they'd managed to be quite entrepreneurial, shall we say, in how they got a pot of money together to start mm. a company and they and the three of them went off and and did that. And it was about six months down the line that they approached me then to go and work with them as the first non-founding uh, member of staff, I guess. But I had shares in the company. And it was exciting because when I got there, they were still trying to work out what it was they actually wanted to make. They had expertise in a certain type of software. And they were trying to work out whether they wanted to make the same thing or whether they wanted to make something completely different. And I think what was interesting was the fact that they didn't rush into deciding what it was they would make. But of course, when you get to a startup company, it's all hands on deck, you know? So it's it's not just a case of you develop flat out all the time. You have to pitch in wherever it's needed. But what we were doing is we were creating a, a desktop application that allowed you to plan your networks. So yeah. it was all hands on deck with that. I was wondering... If you were working on features that clients had specifically requested, because this is something that me and Adam were talking about last week with my project. So, yeah, we knew when we decided we would make some cell planning software, but of course we were going to fix up all the sort of issues that we saw in that software previously. But then the next thing you need is somebody you think might buy it off you. And that's when we sort of started dealing more with a client in America who eventually bought a load of consultancy off us. And I guess it was at that point of getting out there and working with them in that consultancy based way that we got a hold of more requirements or things that they needed. So then we were able to build those into the platform. Because I've not had experience with it personally, but I've seen it happen where they're in, in like in like a business point of view to try and please your customers you can just accept a lot of these asks and requirements and what these people want and it it really deteriorates the quality of the product it, but... it's needs and, and wants isn't it i guess it's all that upfront design or no upfront design where does it set the more chance you can really understand what that user wants upfront and before you get going then I think probably the better the software is going to be in the long run. And yeah, I, I think it's that fine line of we had to respond enough such that we, because ultimately we were there giving this consultancy, but we wanted them to buy the product in a big way. So saying no to any of their requests, requests would have not got us to where we wanted to go. But yeah, mm -hmm. saying yes to everything. One of the guys I used to work with he always used to say when everything is in first place everything is in last place and I always remember him saying that mm. and I and I stuck with me you have to be able to prioritize have to be able to work with that client so you give them enough of what they need and a bit of what they want whilst not destroying what you're trying to do within the software isn't it it's a balancing act you know all the time between the quality of the software and the money that you you need to bring in. Mm. That's why we make software is to make money. Yeah, I mean, and I think it's particularly hard in startups because you're so focused on that burn rate. And you've normally mm. not got the biggest pot of money to, to keep going. And so you want to build something that is going to bring money in so because obviously if you're employing people you have responsibilities there and you want to make money off what you're doing so you want to be successful in that way don't you but if you totally ignore the quality aspects of software you are going to get yourself into a sticky place in a few months time yeah, it's yeah. just going to get slower and slower to be able to add those features and respond to the client i feel like as software engineers we want everything we make to be perfect to be the ideal solution you know to a certain problem but there is a point when it's not perfect but it's enough yeah I think if you're a natural perfectionist and you tend towards that I think it's something you'll always battle with and it's hard I think to be a perfectionist in software and I genuinely believe there's no such thing as the perfect software and I think perhaps the time pressure that comes in with needing to deliver something prevents people from getting to that point of perfect that they strive for but which is probably impossible to reach you know I don't think I've got solutions for it at all 
I generate these lists of like to do this and I add, oh, this is buggy. Oh, I don't quite like this. But when I get closer to the deadline, it becomes quite easy to throw away the things that matter less, right? I mean, work to it as long as there's like reason to to do it and, and there's like a deadline. If you're doing it for no, well, I, I'm rambling a little bit here, but if you're doing it for no reason, I don't think it's valuable. I, I think there's something about fit for purpose, not fit for perfect, if, mm, if that kind of makes nice. sense. And and I think the ta- this is where time pressure perhaps does help, because I agree with Adam that the things that you might think, the things you might prioritise without the time pressure, that will fall away as soon as the time pressure is there. And then perhaps that helps you or saves you from this quest for perfection that is almost impossible to achieve anyway. Yeah, yeah it, it, it's tricky. But I've, I think I've probably had more success in my career when I try to put perfection to one side. Because very good is normally good enough, really. It just needs yeah. to be enough, not perfect. You can strive for perfect, which I think is kind of Adam's mantra. And yes, you should strive for it, but do you have to reach it? I don't think so, no. Hmm. It can be enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and if you're working to produce software that is ultimately going to make you money... And you've made it perfect. You probably spent too long on it. And I think, are you ever really 100% happy with what you've made? Because you made it. You know all the little flaws where things could be improved. But as long as you have like a baseline of laziness, right? Which I have. And there's definitely work I could do on. And Ryan knows I have many projects that I start and don't finish. (laughs) But at some point I see, actually, I don't think it's worth the effort anymore. I think if you have that, then... But it doesn't negate what that project did for you at the time because it can be a learning situation, right? Mm. And then at some point you get more information and you ditch it for whatever reason. So that can be interesting. I think you'd learn more, though, by finishing a project. (laughs) (laughs) You'd learn even more. Yes, you can learn by half doing a project, but what about if you did it completely? (laughs) I'll complete one of them. (laughs) And that is the perfectionist in me, though. <laughs> well, at some point, I think, well, actually, the problems are now insurmountable. <laughs> I'm just going to do something new and easy. But is that always going to be the problem? No, I you agree. Know? Yeah. I do it for fun, really. Only it becomes no longer fun. But I guess the ultimate thing here is if you can make it both, then mm. you live in the dream, you know? So what, for you, do you think is the most exciting thing about the future of software engineering? Wow, that's a, that's a big question. <laughs> the most exciting thing about software for me is always it's always the people in it, isn't it? So it's the students that I see every year and thinking about where they're going to go, like looking at you two now, imagining where you might be, where might you be in, in 15 years' time with all the ideas you have. And I guess the really interesting developments that I'll be looking out for, I suppose everybody's looking out for where we might go with things like the metaverse, etc., and and VR, but also what about people who wouldn't want to be using VR? And also things like automation, cars and stuff. Will my kids ever need to learn to drive? And I don't know what the answer is. So things like that's really exciting to me. I think I, th- I feel differently. I feel positively about it from a social aspect and I feel fearful from a software aspect, right? Yeah, I think the the bit that makes me feel fearful is the transition point between, for example, when it comes to automation and cars, humans being involved and machines being involved and all that happening at the same time. Mm. If we can get to the point where just machines drive cars, then I think that might be a nice place to be. Or or just humans driving cars. But when we've got that crossover point, I think that's going to be that combo, which I guess we're sort of in now to an extent. I think that's an interesting thing. Is there anything you want to ask us before we go? Oh, no. Oh, no. I think you, <laughs> I think you might have just thrown at me the one question I tend to throw <laughs> as, at students as the very last Viva question or something, you know. <laughs> what, what should I have asked you and whatever? <laughs> okay. What do you think is the most significant piece of learning you'll take from academic studies into the world of software? I don't think any, like, particular technology or language or anything like that can be particularly valuable because it will just change in five years time and if that's all I took away from university it'd be kind of worthless Um, so I think 
there's a lot of like softer skills and like connections and things that I've made, like meeting Ryan, for example, that has been like very useful with university. I think that there's a degree of freedom that you get much more than secondary school and much more than being in a job where you're you know expected to do certain things that's valuable to just throw things at the wall and see what sticks. I think for me, because I was from a web developer background before university, and then I came to university to learn. I wanted to learn things, and I have had value out of it. You know, I have learned a lot over the last three years. It's the guidance that I think is the value that you get from university, because learning these topics on your own, you don't really know where to start. Yeah. But you kind of get to follow a path along when you take a degree in software engineering or computer science that will allow you to find out things on your own along the way, you know? So it's the people that you meet and it's the opportunity to think and develop thoughts more freely, less constrained around them. Yeah. Yeah. I think without it, you can learn things, but you're less likely to meet like-minded and different-minded people. And you probably do a, read a couple of books and do some courses on plural site, but it doesn't give you that moralistic feel, does it? And I think lots of learning comes from the people that you're around. I would have su- summarised it in the same way. Well, thank you for joining us, Catherine. It was very enjoyable. Thank you for asking our questions. Yes, yeah, thank you very much for being here. And thank you for inviting me. And I'm really enjoying listening to the podcast. So please carry on and uh, good luck for your futures. Brilliant. There we go. End of episode. Uh, <laughs> it's super long, guys. You need to cut it. <laughs> there, there'll be a lot of cutting in there.